name is Jared, and we're here today at the uh, Amnesia Festival. We are talking about upstairs a bit, how uh, you are here with the Throwdown, mm -hmm. and uh, talk about the albums that you worked on, because the albums that you worked on with that band are, well, one of them at least, is considered right. like a benchmark. We did, okay, so Dave Peters and I did Haymaker together. Um, the next one we did was uh, Deathless. Right? Yep. And then Intolerance, uh, the latest record. So, yeah, we did those three. So, um, like... Which I guess that dates back to, I don't know, sometime around like 2002? Does that sound about right? For Haymaker? No. Haymaker 2003? Uh, three or four. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I should know that, but... Yeah. <laughs> brain shot from the day. <laughs> At first, like, I didn't recognize that it was you on that album because there's more double bass than I, I heard using the other recordings. Totally, totally. Um, talk about how you came up with those patterns, because there were some patterns on there, like, like some, you know, drum uh, patterns and, like, breakdowns and stuff. Are you talking about Haymaker? Yeah. Bass, that, a lot of that was just mocking the, uh, the riffs that Tommy Love and Keith Barney had on that record. So I was just kind of syncing up with with the, uh, with the riffs. Um, I'm gonna be honest, I'm not like, I wasn't used to doing that, you know, prior to that record, because I was, you know, I think playing for the Suicide for Alan, you know, bands like that at the time. All the albums that you've been on, um, I guess, talk a bit about the effect that you're aware that each album has had on people's lives, like the album as a whole. Okay. And uh, maybe what role you're you feel your drumming might have played in those records? That's, a, that's an interesting question. I don't know much about like the effect it's had. I mean, I know that the background music had a big effect, you know, just like overall. But uh, I've always kind of just been that like underdog, you know. Um, but I guess talking about each record, uh, you, you want to start with like Death by Stereo. Sure. Or you yeah. know, I started with Death by Stereo, um, and then moved on to Adamantium, and then. American Nightmare, that was with background music. And then what was next? Uh, Hope Conspiracies End Note, we talked about that. Yeah. And then the Suicide File, all the Suicide File records, because I was just doing the Suicide File basically, <clears throat> because I wanted to do a band where I could actually play that style of music, but uh, still go to school at the same time. Um, I couldn't do that with Hope Con or AN, because both of those bands were trying to be like full time. Uh, and that's how kind of the Suicide File started. Because not, aside from myself, uh, a few of the other guys were like students as well. So, okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, so it made sense, you know what I mean? Right. We could still be kind of like intertwined in that, but, you know. Um, I, I honestly feel that um, the When Tigers Fight record that you were on, yeah. Ghost Story, uh, was on par in terms of the degree of desperate emotion. Yeah. Like dark, like dark, somber emotion, as the background uh, music was. Oh wow! Let's see that album, the Hope Conspiracy album, the the Tigers Fight record. They're all kind of similar to me in like emotion. Uh huh. Tell me a bit how you feel those records convey emotion and convey suffering, because those three very dark albums. I you know I'll probably take a little bit different angle at this, mm -hmm. <laughs> so not to like mm -hmm. like. I, my my place in this whole thing was I just really liked playing drums and like meeting these new friends at the time, such as like Tim from American Nightmare, and my friend Kevin who was a singer of Hope Con, and I just realized that the the minute that I moved out there that there was this new movement, and it was like there was this hot pocket for hardcore, you know, with like Converge putting out Jane Doe and Bane doing Give Blood, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and of course, American Nightmare, Suicide Foul, Hokan, they were kind of a part of that because it was all happening at the same time. And it just so happened that, like, these bands, uh, you know, one after another needed, needed you know, a uh, drum position. <clears throat> but randomly, I had friends that were, uh, that were involved with Open Conspiracy, like Aaron Lisi was an Adamantium, so... You know, I had previous uh, experience writing with him, yeah. um, so that kind of 
you can kind of hear that uh, in that record. If you kind of listen to Adam and Tim, you can kind of hear a little bit of that. You know yeah. what I mean? But uh, I think each record kind of had its own little flavor. You know what I mean? Like, with, with background music, it seemed just like uh, sort of that really fast, pissed... See, the thing with that record is, like, I came straight from Southern California, so I was playing almost like that typewriter beat, that no effects, and I got kind of ridiculed lightly uh, by my friend Tim. He's like, oh, it's too, it's like too SoCal. It's not, like, hardcore enough. So I remember getting that record back, and it, and I'm sorry, I'm getting off the subject, but this is, this is, okay. This is great. (laughs) Okay, but, uh. The way that it was mixed, they said, uh, I don't know if it was Tim or someone else said that like they mixed it so that you could feel the kick drum but not hear it because if you heard it, it wouldn't be as like authentic, old school hardcore or East Coast because I'd come from the West Coast playing more of the do ba do ba do ba do ba not do ba do ba do you know what I'm saying? Like ignite different, d- exactly different versus, uh, yeah. different bass drum patterns, you know. Yeah. But I personally. Uh, you're cool. You're cool. Uh, I personally liked that, that um, I don't know, that really super rapid uh, kick and snare back and forth. Me too, actually. More kicks, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I enjoyed playing it. I felt like I was uh, a little more consistent and tighter playing that particular beat, but when I dropped it in with American Nightmare, it almost made it sound like, I don't know, two like fat records or something. You know what I'm saying? Well, that's it. Um, and I get it, but I just remember that particular moment with that album, you know. Epitaph, the whole, you know, whole past, I mean, Good Riddance, for example, Yeah. you know, um, yeah. Sean Sellers, yeah. I love yeah. that drummer. Yeah, and, and Russ is a friend of mine, and like, I, I remember, like, listening to that, that heavy kick, going like, I love this, you know? Yeah, yeah, I remember when I first saw Good Riddance uh, play in Corona, California, um, Sean had a bunch of shredded paper in his bass drum as muffling, right? So every time he would hit it, it was like paper flying everywhere. Like paper that you would wrap shit with, you know what I mean? Like packages. And I was like, what the hell? What is this, you know? I, I've heard of everything, but that was new to me. And I was like, this is uh, it's something else, you know? Why not just stick like, you know, a pillow or something? Exactly. But it's cool. I just remember that. Like, oh, that's good. here we are, good riddance. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess they were... It was, it was really loud on that record. Yeah. The kick drum. And... Uh, We're talking the, which record? Uh, Ballads. Yes. Yeah. They're really loud. Yeah. It was clicky and loud and, and punchy. Yeah. Almost on the uh, metal record. And they covered yeah. into a song, you yeah. know. Um, whereas in American Nightmare, yeah, I guess it is maybe a yeah. mold school because the yeah. kick drum is a You could bit, hear it kind of trucking along, but yeah. you, for me, and maybe for other drummers, you... There was a little bit of a struggle to hear, like, the definition and, uh, and like, what was going on. But you could tell it was there, you know? Yeah. It's almost like if the cute drum is loud, it's either punk or metal. Yeah. If it's you know, muffled, it sounds more raw and more hardcore for some reason. Mm-hmm. It's funny how that works. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, well, Hope Clown was pretty much a single case. More, like, traditional punk on that one. Yeah. Is that possible? It plays a little bit different on EndNote. Yes, EndNote. Um, EndNote was, I think, going into it uh, with just like playing drums and like being a part of the writing process. We wanted to have a much like sludgier, kind of raunchy, like drum sound. <clears throat> so what we did was we put PA a PA in the room, firing the kick and snare back into all the microphones and then we had like uh, PZM realistic mics slapped on the walls and it was a lot of bleed going in uh, going on I should say Um, and it almost had like this big mushy kind of overall vibe going on but I thought it was cool you know what I mean I mean it's like uh, coming from like Dean Baltolones doing American Nightmare and the Suicide File and other records. It was de- to me, it was definitely drastically different sonically than those other records. Uh, and I'm, I know we're talking about kick drum patterns, but oh. it was def, yeah, more mid tempo, like a thrashier gallop, you know what I'm saying? That's it. Compared to the real straightforward, punchy, aggressive in your face, you know what I mean? And actually, um, you know. uh, 
I think the reason, though, to answer your question is yeah. because of the tempos and the nature of the riffs uh, right. and writing. You know what I'm saying? It might not sound uh, that rad, in my opinion, if it had like different kick drum parts, like do bad, do do bad, like with those riffs. Right, right, right. That's just my opinion. Though. Yeah. I saw Hope Con twice in the EP on the demo. Great. Which I absolutely loved. Yeah, me too. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and I played a few shows with them, and uh, I really wanted to. If I wanted to play the whole EP, the whole demo, you know, but some of those songs at the time they didn't they didn't play. But yeah, yeah. Um, and then Cold Blue, like that drummer. Yeah. Um, Adam. Yeah. He was a beast. Yeah, like yeah. he was really exciting to watch. Yeah. And seeing that band kind of come out of nowhere, well, I mean, I was a fan yeah. of piecemeal, obviously. But then when they started coming around, I saw Hope Cop for the first time with their coldest life and hate breed. Cool. Around, I think, maybe 2000. Right. I think Cold was just about to come out. Yeah. Because they got the DG pack. Right. And then they pressed it in the jewel. And, uh, I only knew of uh, Kevin and also the Harvest dudes. Yeah. I was, a, I was a big fan of Harvest. You cool. Know? Yeah. Um, and, uh, I, I really think, wow, this guy fucking hits hard. Yeah. And I like his patterns. He's just a big dude, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Play, playing ride cymbals. And he had this snare drum called the Heavy Rock 9, <laughs> which was this 9-inch, uh, sorry, I'm done with my coffee. Sorry. No, 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 yeah, yeah. Ditch it. Well, yeah, yeah, you're yeah, dusted yeah. too. So, uh, it was this, like, 9-inch snare drum, uh, brass with, like, uh, it had like like felt rings on the inside or something. I don't know, some weird thing, but I remember he had that kit and then he had a, uh, a pearl drum set that he took in his basement and stripped it down so that it was like a natural finish. I don't know, that guy was cool. I liked his drumming too. Yeah. A lot yeah. of force. Big time, man. Totally. And his patterns are, are quite unique. Like, yeah. It's not what you usually expect. Right. Um, so, I think if you had played on those records, yeah. I don't think it would have sounded that different, to be honest. Because he has a similar feel yeah. for the slow stuff right? as you do, you know? like I think, yeah, we were both probably just trying to, like, play what was best for the band, you know? And not, like, really change the band that much. That's it. Um, and I think that's important, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, Never Buried Alive? Yes. Death in Your Perfect World? Right. The album on Victory, the first one there? Mm-hmm. Uh, Jesse from Despair, who's now in a hardcore band called Wreckage. Okay. Out of Buffalo, really good. Yeah. Um, he plays single kick on that record. Yeah. That's one of the most metal records yeah. ever put on a victory. Totally. I mean, you recall that record, eh? Yeah. Steve Evans did it. Yeah. Scott hated the mix. He said it sounded like death metal. He said he made his voice sound like death metal, which it did. Yeah. Scott's like, you know, like one octave above de death metal, if, uh, okay. if you consider it, you know? Yeah. Even like, well, the death metal is on a higher register. Yeah. So he has a very heavy voice. Yeah. He, but, you know, he didn't like the mix, but the record was all single kick. Yeah. I mean, do you remember the performance of that record? Like, yeah, totally. It's almost like Hope Con, you know. Totally. In yeah. a way, like, yeah. attacking it. Right. Almost like Helmet. Like a little more, let's say, creative Helmet. Right. Because Helmet I love. Yeah. John Stainer, I mean. Dude, totally. Super unique. I used to collect unique. helmet bootlegs. Like. Uh, kick and snare. We were listening to that the other night at this drive show. Uh, it was on the uh, front of house after we played, uh, or later on that night uh, uh, at St. Vitus. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm here with Throwdown just because Dave, the singer, and I have been friends for, for I don't know, like probably 12 years maybe, give or take. And uh, it's just one of those things where I had like the time to do it and... He's like, hey, you want to go to Canada? Originally, I thought I would be uh, on tour with another band, but um, but then it just so happened that I was out with Strife, and then Thornhill was playing the next day. So, uh, you know, I was like, fingers crossed. Let's try not to get these two bands, you know, mixed up. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, man. What else are you into these days in terms of culture, you know, books, shows, uh Information sources. Uh, living in, uh, down by the beach in Carlsbad. I'm really into that right now. Um, um, I have a couple friends that I really like recording with. Uh, one being a guy named Paul Miner. 
uh, Death by Stereo, and my other friend Bo Burchell, who has a cool place up in uh, L.A. called The Cottage. Um, just drum collecting. Um, yeah, man. Food. <laughs> so talk a little about, I guess, the restaurants you love uh, back home. Okay, my fa- one of my favorites is a place called Solace in Encinitas. Um, there's a place called Cucina Enuteca, which is a rad, like, Italian place, and that's in the Del Mar area. Um, I like a coffee shop called uh, Zumbar. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, there's places in L.A. too, but uh, I would probably focus on San Diego, obviously, because I live there. So, uh, I you thank you for your effort. It was great. Awesome, dude. Great job. Cool.